Well, first I had to find a Pontiac dealership, which wasn't easy. The fastback design is pure function. When I heard they were going to destroy them all, I hid it. You might say these cars are strange. Corvair by Chevrolet. Or you might say they're just plain ugly. The car for those who, like you, choose to go first class all the way. But either way, they were definitely weird. It's not more than you need, just more than you're used to. And all were made by just one car company, General Motors. Here are my picks for the top 10 weirdest cars from GM. Hey, Chili, is this your ride? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to sit up high, check everything out. I mean, it is a Cadillac of minivans. Cool. Yeah, check this out. Wow. You mind if I take it for a spin? So you may ask why I limited this list to just cars from General Motors. After all, there are plenty of other weird cars made over the past few decades. But as I was compiling my list, it became clear that a considerable number of my favorite weird cars were made by GM. So I decided to narrow down this list to just GM. But just because they were weird doesn't mean they were all sales flops, like I featured in two other episodes. It's the All-American Roadster. Some of the cars on this list actually sold pretty well back in the day. And just because they're weird doesn't mean they're all ugly, but yeah, some of them really are. By the way, although I usually just focus on cars from the 80s to mid-2000s, I am including some from the 60s and 70s for this list, as I couldn't pass up some good examples from those decades. Number 10, Chevrolet Corvair. Yes, this is the car that Ralph Nader wrote about in his infamous 1965 book, Unsafe at Any Speed. But the Corvair made my list not because of the car's features that earned its spot in that book, but just the overall design that was so different than any other GM car then or since. The Corvair, whose name came from a combination of Corvette and Bel Air, was GM's only car with an air-cooled engine mounted in the rear, and was an attempt to emulate the success of the Volkswagen Beetle. During its first generation that lasted from 1960 to 64, it was offered in no less than six different body styles. Coupe, sedan, convertible, wagon, van, and even a pickup. This last one was the most unusual, as it had an additional door on the side that could be lowered to the ground. This was necessary because the rear tailgate had to be raised to accommodate the engine in the rear. Although the Corvair was larger than the Beetle it tried to emulate, it was still far smaller than most other cars at the time, as it began production following the huge heavy vehicles of the 1950s. Its flat six engine was made from aluminum and of course drove the rear wheels via a transaxle. Having so much of its weight in the rear, GM recommended the pressure of the front tires to be nearly half of the rear to help prevent oversteer. But the oversteer of course happened often, since most owners would keep the pressure on all four tires the same, like any other car. The Corvair also had a swing axle suspension, which was intended to improve ride quality, but instead often helped contribute to the car's instability. Despite a redesign for 1965, sales couldn't keep up with the Ford Mustang that was introduced the year before. But the bigger impact was likely Ralph Nader's book that came out that same year, tarnishing the Corvair's reputation. If General Motors wishes to know why I spent an inordinate amount of time on the Corvair, it is because the Corvair is an inordinately dangerous vehicle. GM management turned their attention to developing a more comparable sports car to the Mustang, leading to the Camaro for 1969. The NHTSA, which itself came about indirectly as a result of this book, did their own investigation and cleared GM of any wrongdoing, rating the Corvair similar to other cars of the time. Despite that, GM never went back to a rear engine design, and today, Corvairs in good condition are worth more than GM probably ever imagined over 50 years ago. Corvair for 1966, waiting for you at the usual place, your Chevrolet dealers. Number 9, the Oldsmobile and Buick Aeropax. So remember at the beginning of this video that I said some of the cars in this list were weird because they were ugly? Well, this is one of them. The late 70s introduced a downsizing of many car models, including GM's A-body platform. In 1978, the Chevrolet Malibu, Pontiac Le Mans, Oldsmobile Cutlass, and Buick Sentry retained their legacy body-on-frame rear-wheel drive layout, but were 600 pounds lighter, and received all-new sheet metal that would come to define the boxy car design for the 1980s. For the Olds and Buick versions, GM didn't offer a traditional three-box style four-door, instead offered a more radical slant-back design, which GM dubbed the Aeroback. The Aeroback was also offered as a two-door alongside a more traditional coupe design. <laughs> Despite the large back window suggesting a hatchback, it wasn't. Instead, the Aeroback had a trunk with a smaller than typical opening, eliminating a hatchback's usefulness. The original design was supposed to be a hatchback, but to save cost, GM nixed the rear door 
and made it a fixed rear window instead. The public response clearly wasn't what GM expected, and sales took a nosedive. The Oldsmobile version was called the Cutlass Salon, I guess implying it was more upscale, but clearly that didn't work. Believe it or not, there was actually a 442 version of the Cutlass available as an aeroback, although it wasn't much more than an appearance package, considering the 442 trim could be had with the base V6. Buick also offered a Turbo Century aeroback as well, so each are so rare today that they have become a minor cult hit among car enthusiasts. Sales of both the Buick and Oldsmobile A-bodies dropped by half from 1977 to 78, leading GM to quickly develop a traditional three-box design for both cars in time for 1980 to replace the aeroback, after which sales rose dramatically. Today, these aerobacks have virtually disappeared from our roads, and that's probably a good thing if you ever got to see one in person. Number 8. The new Chevrolet HR. Chevrolet HHR. Here's an example of GM trying to join in on the early 2000s retro style craze, but instead of a unique looking design, what most anyone thought when they saw the Chevy HHR at its introduction in 2005 Chevy HHR, an American Revolution. was a ripoff of the hideous Chrysler PT Cruiser. But what many of those observers may not have realized was that the HHR's designer was Brian Nesbitt, who GM hired from Chrysler after he designed the PT Cruiser. Although the PT definitely has its critics today, it was one of Chrysler's hottest cars soon after its debut in 2001, so GM hoped they could replicate that success. Except, by the time the HHR arrived, interest in the PT Cruiser and retro-style cars in general was already past its peak. The HHR wasn't exactly a sales flop, at least not at first, with over 105,000 sold in its best sales year of 2007, but still nowhere close to the PT Cruiser sales in its early years. Based on GM's compact Delta platform that was shared with the Saturn Ion, Chevy Cobalt, and Pontiac G5, the HHR name was meant to refer to Heritage High Roof, essentially a shrunken 1940s Chevy Suburban. I mean, the very first utility vehicle ever built was a 49 Suburban. To help increase sales, Chevy also offered a panel version, with the rear seats and carpeting removed and replaced with a plastic load floor, and the windows and exterior door handles removed from the rear doors, although the rear doors could still be opened from the inside. Since Chevy offered an SS version of the Cobalt, the same was offered for the HHR starting with the 2008 model year. The SS had a 2 liter turbo standard with a manual transmission that made 265 horsepower, and the SS was even offered on the panel version for 2009. That's really weird. A rare combination that has made that version the only one that may increase in value someday. But the SS option was dropped for all HHRs by 2010, with overall sales dropping sharply each year. 2011 was the final year for the HHR. And when seen on the road today, it will sadly always be known as GM's too late jump on the retro bandway. Number 7. GM EV1 The car of the future today. I recently did a whole episode on this car, but figured it definitely needed to be included on this list. Although it wasn't GM's first electric car, it was GM's only car ever sold as GM, but could only be purchased in Saturn dealerships. Saturn? No fucking way. And only in just a few select cities, mostly in the southwest U.S., as the batteries could only maintain a decent charge in warm weather. Based on the Impact concept car from 1990, it was renamed the EV1 upon its release in 1996. Although GM publicly announced to build thousands of EV1s at the Lansing Craft Center in Michigan, once home to the Buick Riata, internally their own market research made it clear that the EV1 would never come close to making a profit so they preferred to keep it as a limited production concept. In fact, GM never offered the EV1 for sale, but instead as leases limited to three years, and could not be bought out at the end of the lease. But when the state of California saw the EV1's potential, they introduced drastic legislation that would force all automakers to offer EVs in increasing quantities over the following years, or be blocked from selling cars in their state. People have a concept of electric vehicles that they're essentially golf carts and they're not going to be viable. What GM proved with the impact is that if you go about it right, it could be made a viable product. GM and other automakers eventually sued and were able to get these mandates overturned. But production on the EV1 was ended long before then, in 1999 with only 1,117 units ever built. Despite a dedicated following by a relatively small number of early adopters, GM continued to sell the remaining EV1s up until February 2002, at which point they required all remaining cars to be returned, regardless of their lease end date. Some EV1s were spared for museums and research purposes, but their drive lines disabled to ensure GM would no longer be liable for them. The remaining EV1s were sent to the crusher, making it impossible that you will ever see one on the road today.
Ironically, Elon Musk took a controlling interest in Tesla in response to the EV1s being crushed, and GM has been playing catch-up ever since. Who killed the electric car? And for God's sake, why? Number 6. The Bustleback Cadillac Seville For its second generation, Cadillac wanted to make some changes to its Seville model to bring in more younger buyers. At its launch in 1975, the first generation Seville was introduced as a result of the 1973 gas crisis and was Cadillac's smallest car, despite still being over 200 inches long. But the average buyer age wasn't dropping, so the second gen Seville, introduced in 1979 for the 1980 model year, was now sharing a platform with the Eldorado and switched to front wheel drive. But more importantly, at least in terms of why it is on this list, was this radical rear end that came to be known as the Bustleback. Although the overall length remained the same as the first gen, the shape of the trunk lid made for an illusion that the car was shorter than it actually was. The Bustleback idea came from Bill Mitchell, a longtime GM designer originally brought in in 1936 by the legendary Harvey Earl. The Bustleback Cadillac was one of Mitchell's last designs, and a rare moment of risk that Cadillac, or GM in general, wasn't known for back then. Although sales in 1979 topped 50,000, sales dropped below 40,000 for 1980, and below 20,000 just two years later. Although to be fair, the Bustleback alone wasn't the only reason for the sales drop. The infamous V864 engine, which was so bad I had included it in my first sales flop video, as well as its replacement, the HD4100, and the just as infamous Oldsmobile V8 diesel, Cadillac's reliability overall took a serious hit. The digital dash introduced in 1981 also wasn't well received by Cadillac's typically older clientele, so the Bustleback just added on to the list of disappointments. The Bustleback stayed on until 1986, replaced by the third gen Seville, which brought back a more traditional squared off trunk lid, which just emphasized how much the last version wasn't the hit the Cadillac hoped it would be. Today, any Cadillac that is still around from the 80s is a rare find, but seeing a second gen is now a rare treat for a glimpse at one of the earliest risky designs for Cadillac, although it definitely wasn't their last. Number 5. Chevrolet SSR Yes, this one was in my first sales flops video, but that doesn't exclude it from being in this top 10 as well. The SSR was intended to be a modern take on Chevrolet's pickups from the 1930s, but since it was based on the GMT 360 SUV platform that didn't have a separate cabin bed, had a folding convertible top, and had a non-removable bed cover that made the bed more like a large trunk, it ended up being in a category all its own. Based on a concept that was introduced in 2000, the SSR was inspired by other retro style cars of the time, such as the Plymouth Prowler, a car I know very well, as I own one. The SSR would be the last car that GM built in the Lansing Craft Center, which once built the GM EV1, and originally built the Buick Riata. By this point, since every car built there was only limited production runs, anyone starting there for the SSR had to know the chances of a long run were slim. Whereas the Prowler lacked any sort of practicality, the SSR's truck bed could carry a decent amount of stuff. However, the SSR's V8 engine offered at its launch in 2003 was sorely lacking, thanks to all the weight it had to move. The V8 got a bump in power for 2005, which helped sales a bit short term, but at the same time dropped the value of the older models. So did I include the SSR in this list of weird cars because it's ugly? Well I know the SSR still has a lot of fans, so all I will say here is that beauty is in the eyes of the beholder, and leave it at that. Of course, some SSR owners may think the Prowler is ugly. What do I say about that? Well, they're wrong, of course. Number 4. GMC Envoy XUV Back in the early 2000s, GM introduced what may have been its worst abuse of badge engineering, the GMT 360 SUV platform, home to six different vehicles. Well, technically seven if you count the previous vehicle on this list, the SSR, as it shared the same underpinnings. The six SUVs were the Chevy Trailblazer, Oldsmobile Bravada, Buick Rainier, Isuzu Ascender, Saab 97X, and finally, the GMC Envoy. To make their version stand out, GMC came up with the idea of offering a sliding retractable roof on the Envoy and made the rear portions inside be like a truck bed instead of a third row of seating. This idea wasn't entirely new, as the Studebaker Wagoneer offered a sliding retractable roof in 1963, but the Envoy XUV had a rear door that could swing out or drop like a traditional truck tailgate and provided a mid-gate behind the second row of seats. This allowed the back portion to be watertight and could even be hosed out, although the design for draining water was a bit unusual. The XUV's profile was easy to spot from a regular Envoy thanks to the taller roof and larger roof rails which extended down the sides of the rear. 
But more importantly, the powered roof mechanism added 90 pounds and two additional inches to the highest point of the car, which adversely affected the handling. The XUV could only be had on the longer wheelbase Envoy that normally would have a third row of seats. So buyers of the XUV lost the third row of seats, but still had a longer truck. GMC offered the XUV for the 2004 and 2005 model years, but with only 27,000 sold and a big drop from the first to second year, GMC lost interest in continuing the XUV, making it a relatively rare find today. The first SUV with a power sliding rear roof. Number three, Pontiac Aztec. No list of weird cars is complete without the Aztec. And yes, this one is weird primarily for one reason. It's ugly. <laughs> yes, the Aztec had its fans, but typically it was because of what it could do, not because its styling was just plain bizarre. For many years, Pontiac was trying to be GM's performance division, but by the 2000s, Pontiacs were just rebadged Chevrolets, and unique Pontiac models, like the ill-fated Fiero, were rare exceptions. One thing that Pontiac didn't have was an SUV, or at least something that kind of resembled an SUV. But as a buddy of mine, Kevin, says, this thing is neither station wagon nor SUV. Rather, it's the first generation UV. Although the term crossover really hadn't become mainstream yet, the easiest way for GM to get an SUV without using a truck frame was to rework their existing minivan platform. Oh yeah, UV, he reckons it stands for ugly vehicle. Although here again, the Aztec platform wasn't unique to Pontiac. Buick used the same platform for their rendezvous, but with styling that, although it wasn't pretty, wasn't nearly as offensive. The design of the Aztec clearly was intended for a younger, and I guess a more hip audience. Pontiac tried to push the whole outdoorsy theme here, with a center console that doubled as an ice cooler, a split rear hatch that allowed for tailgating. Life is indeed sweet. And even a custom made tent could be attached out back. Yet despite these unique features, most anyone else couldn't get past the Aztec's face. At its launch in 2000, they unveiled the first car, and the audience gasped and then laughed. People tend to see the front of cars as a face, and although typically that face on cars today is mean and aggressive, the Aztec's four eyes and four nostrils was just scary, and not in a good way. <laughs> With plenty of gray plastic cladding in its first model year of 2001, that made it look even worse. Later model years switched to paint color matched cladding. Even more youth-oriented colors, such as yellow, could not increase sales, which never topped 28,000 per year, and was scheduled for cancellation in 2004, after just a few thousand more were sold for 2005. But oddly enough, several years later, the Aztec became a cult favorite, thanks to the TV show Breaking Bad. I wouldn't be surprised if sales of used Aztecs increased during that show's run. Didn't have to replace the windshield this time. I know, right? Number two, the Dustbuster vans. We have a quaint little piece from the 1980s. It's called a Dustbuster. With only truck-based minivans like the Chevy Astro, Chevy, Chevy, Astro, Astro. GM was desperate in the mid-80s to develop a proper competitor to Chrysler's runaway success of their minivans, the Dodge Caravan and Plymouth Voyager. But GM wanted to set their minivans apart from the crowd, resulting in three new vans for Chevrolet, Pontiac, and Oldsmobile. Recreating the Space Age frame with plastic panels like they had on the Fiero, and would also use on their new Saturn models, the Lumina APV, Transport, and Silhouette would become the most futuristic looking models GM ever made, although they represented a future that many didn't ever want to see. Although these minivans still only had a sliding door on the passenger side, as the idea of dual sliding doors was still a few years away, inside was a dashboard that seemed big enough to land a plane on, and a second set of A-pillars to support the extremely raked windshield. The Chevrolet version used the same name as their Lumina sedan, but just added APV to the name, even though the two models themselves shared nothing in common. The Transport continued Pontiac's obsession with lots of extra body cladding. Transport, the Pontiac of minivans. Make it so. Whereas the Oldsmobile silhouette tried its best to look a bit more upscale, but with a body shape like that, looking upscale was easier said than done. I mean, it is the Cadillac of minivans. By 1994, a refresh was done to the Chevrolet and Pontiac to make the front end a bit less extreme although oddly the Oldsmobile carried on with the original body style. By this point, Chrysler's minivans were still number one, and Ford's Aerostar was second, leading to a planned redesign for 1996, resulting in all new minivans that ditched the Space Age frame and plastic panels, replaced with a more conventional steel body design. Oddly enough, the GM minivans went from bizarre to boring in just one generation, and would drop all their minivans by 2008. If you see a Dustbuster van on the road today, you may be amazed at the lack of rust, but there's likely plenty behind those plastic panels. And here come the pretzels. Number one, the fourth generation of the Chevy Caprice. Yeah, I'm probably gonna get some hate mail for this one, as I've had several requests to feature the Caprice in an upcoming episode. I still am considering that, 
but it doesn't mean that I would have kind words for this generation of the Chevy Caprice. I put this one at number one simply because it was a rare GM car that took a big risk in design as compared to its previous generation, and yet still managed to sell over 100,000 a year for five years. Yes, many of those sales were for police and taxis, but still, He's in a cab. the Caprice managed to go from one of the most square and frankly boring large sedans to the exact opposite, a shape that many back then considered, and still do today, looks a lot like a whale butt. This radical body design sat upon a largely unchanged chassis, engine, and drivetrain from the Caprice's third generation. Initially offered with a body that extended over the rear wheels, this feature was removed a couple years later to a fully open wheel well, followed by a change in the rear quarter windows to help make the overall shape seem a bit less bulbous. A wagon model was also offered, being one of the last truly full-size wagons in production. With a length of over 18 feet and a curb weight exceeding 4,300 pounds, it's one of the biggest, heaviest cars that you can buy anywhere. Like all big sedans back then, only a V8 would do, ranging from 4.3 to 5.7 liters, depending on what duty it would be expected to perform. The same basic look would be carried over to the Buick Roadmaster, a name brought back from the 1950s, and even Oldsmobile brought back its custom cruiser wagon, but only for two years. But the version most enthusiasts remember is the 1994 Impala SS, which shared the Caprice sedan body, but under the hood was a 5.7 liter LT1 V8 from the fourth generation Corvette, but slightly detuned so that the Impala SS would make more low end torque, 330 pound feet, and 260 horsepower. Initially, it was only available in black, but later dark cherry and dark green were available. The Impala would only last through 1996 to correspond with the ending of the entire Caprice line. And why did these big behemoths end their run? Well, of course, so GM could swap out their production for the next big thing, SUVs. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, click the like button and subscribe to my channel. If you once owned a car from the 80s to mid 2000s that you rarely see today and would like it featured in a future episode, leave a reply in the comments or contact me at the email shown here. See you next time.